Graham, welcome to the show. It's fantastic to finally have you on. I know we've been trying to get you on for quite some time now. Um, you have been exceptionally busy this last year, so uh, it's good to finally get you here. Um, now, I think we'll just kick straight into it. I think what I, I want to talk to you about you, and you and I have known each other a little while, and we've been working with you as a client for a little while, but the, the actual story of how you came into Fluent um, and what Fluent is, uh, I know, but how you came into it, I don't. So why don't we cover off both those topics? Tell me how you sort of started off with Fluent and then what Fluent actually does as a business. Sure, will do. And, uh, yeah, good to be here. Thanks for having me on. I've been pretending to be extremely important and busy. <laughs> You've been doing a good job. <laughs> been doing, I, I do that well. Um, yeah, so how I, how I came to, to, to Fluent... Um, Immediately prior, well, let's let's try and condense this into a couple of minutes, right? <laughs> um, um, you can tell from my accent, like yourself, originally from the UK, but have been in Australia for seventeen years now. Yep. Um, and I'd spent the uh, the the large majority of that time bringing technology companies over from either US or from uh, Europe um, into Asia, usually through Australia, but mm -hmm. not not always. Um, and um, and I, I was it was sort of late stage in in the last one, which is a company called Hybris, a commerce platform, um, which I was running for APAC in China. Yep. Um, and I was really we'd sold the company to SAP, so I was inside a, a large org, and I was really looking, ideally, to find an Asian tech, ideally Australian technology, to take the other way, right? Instead of keep importing yep. things into into Asia, I was trying to trying to take something that was, you know, ideally Australian and take it the other way. And and in um, in in partly in looking for that, but also just generally in the in the all things commerce space that I've been operating in for many years, um, I came across a, a relatively small company that was tackling a huge problem that um, in, in my then current company, Hybris, yep. and in our peer companies, um, the topic of order management, which for this conversation, don't need to know what is what that is, um, <laughs> but the topic of order management was, um, was something that we'd never managed to nail at Hybris. Um, we had bought a company out of Canada um, to, to do that. Um, uh, that, that didn't work so well. We rebuilt that. That didn't work. And then we built our own twi two versions of, and it, and it had never managed to achieve proper enterprise grade um, order management capability. And the same was happening for you know, other companies like us, like Hybris around. Same was happening for um, the major commerce uh, platforms. Um, and then I came across this little company in Australia, um, Fluent, that, that had built some software, had really benefited from a government grant scheme, which was really important uh, um, at the time for it. When was this? What year was this? Roughly? So this was 2015. Okay, yeah. Right? Um, yeah, 2015. I'd come across... Um, this um, this company um, fluent at the time, and during the rest of that year, had had sort of investigated. And what what they had done is built some order management capability, mm -hmm. um, and it was built for enterprise. So, I talked about government grants. So they were benefiting from an R and D grant from the government that was basically covering about forty percent of their R and D costs, okay. and they'd also done a. Um, uh, a deal, a development deal with um, with one of the largest retailers in Australia, and um, and had co-funded development for something specific for them for right. order management for that large enterprise, right? Um, and and so this was working in anger in in one of the largest retailers, right. and okay. I'd, and I'd seen this tech, and was that interesting? Um, and and it was it was funded you know locally um, from from um, local and, and and very good people um, in, in Australia, um, but had no international horizon. Nice yeah. and they they actually approached me. Their board approached me um, late 2015, mm -hmm. and um, uh, asking how you know could they get some advice? Would I be interested in helping them out in? Um, in, in looking in on the, more of an international um, scope for them because they were Australian only at that time. Um, and to cut that story short, you know, it was interesting. I was looking to, you know, what my next thing was going to be. Um, and after giving some advice, they came back and said, actually, would you come and, and run the company for us? Um, Fantastic. So, um, and, and, you know, I was, I was sitting with my big gig in, in SAP 
um, and then told my wife what I was going to going to do, and and um, that was an interesting <laughs> conversation. Um, but ultimately, um, agreed to go join Fluent as their CEO um, early 2016, cool. so just about five years ago. Okay. Um, and um, and yeah, it's 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 been about taking you know building out that tech, internationalizing the company. Um, and um, and going and attacking those big big markets in Europe and, and North America in particular. And I think we have to talk about order management because you said order management numerous times. And, and I know when I first heard that you were an order management you know, business to some degree, I didn't understand what that meant. Um, and I th it's quite it, you, you can simplify it. I know there's quite a lot of complexity to it, but just so that the viewers have an idea of what order management is and what your target market is, I'm sure you can sort of summarise what Fluent Commerce does. <laughs> yeah, um, we try and we try and make it simple for people like me to understand. So um, <laughs> the uh, if you if you think about a, a retail operation, so yep. order management I exists in the commerce arena. Um, if you think about a retail operation, an, an order management system, or, or specifically what we do, which we would call distributed order management, which is a, a level um, a level above um, enhanced order management. So distributed order management um, interacts with every system across an enterprise. So it's yep. typically a larger retail across yep. an enterprise that deals with orders, that deals with locations, and deals with inventory. Right. Now, if you speak to retailers, they will tell you that inventory visibility or lack thereof um, across their enterprise is one of their biggest problems that would stop them, you know, doing some quite funky initiatives. Um, because if they don't really know where everything is or how much it costs to move things from one place to another, um, down to a, an individual product level, an individual SKU level, then it's very difficult for them to in a in a omni-channel world where where um, customers are, are wanting things um, immediately yep. and they're wanting things um, locally um, and you've got big competition from folks like Amazon. Yep. Um, Amazon who uh, who spent three quarters of a billion on which order is, management. Which is a fair bit. <laughs> which is a, a large um, a large war chest. Yes. Um, and it's no surprise therefore that someone like Amazon is able to very efficiently, one of the reasons you know folks use Amazon, they're very they're able to very efficiently get stuff to you. So when you shop with Amazon, you'll typically see delivered within a couple of days. Is that because it's in a warehouse and they know exactly how much is in each warehouse, whereas with retailers, they might have 2,000 stores and they've got no idea necessarily exactly how much is in each store because it's changing constantly, right? People are coming in and buying things. It's exactly that. It's changing constantly. And if you take a market like Australia, where our population is relatively small but yep. very distributed. Yes. Um, you don't tend to hold an awful lot of stock in stores. Um, and, and that means quite often that you can be disappointed if you're going into a store to, to, to buy things um, because your, your particular size might not be there because there's only one of each. Well, you hate it when they say, you know? oh, we, we can order it in or I can see what other store it is. You know, you just, you've already, you've, the magic's gone. The magic right. of walking out the store with it's gone, right? Exactly right. And, and the... the the, the the shame of that uh, is that that item is probably somewhere fairly close in another store or yeah. in a warehouse, um, but that particular store doesn't know about it. Yeah. And so, what what distribute 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 order management is doing um, is taking that kind of issue, so the, the yeah. inventory issues and the location issues and anything to do with an order, and it's really optimizing for all of those things at the same time. Okay, so that. When it comes to your shopping experience, what does that mean for, for us as, as shoppers with a, um, with a retailer that's using our kind of software? Yep. Um, is that you're able to be presented with a range of convenience options, right? That, yeah, okay. that might say, hey, if you want this thing, we can get it to you um, locally. Yep. And here's how you can locally, you can go and pick that up in half an hour from this store. You might have to travel 10 kilometers to do that, but yep. they've got one, you can go get it now. Or if you want it shipped to you quickly, we can get it to you within you know, three hours because we, we know somewhere that can, can get okay, that, we know cool, how much yeah. it costs. Um, or, or maybe it's that thing isn't local, but we can get it overnight to you, to your house. Um, and, and knowing that when that promise is made, that it's being made as a result of stock being on hand somewhere yep. and the cost of moving that stock being one that the retailers 
willing to, to wear. Yep. Um, and so that we're not breaking that promise that have been made. So it enables those retailers to compete with an Amazon that's typically saying 48 hour delivery. Yep. But if I've got 100 stores in Australia and, I, and Amazon have got three warehouses, I ought to be able to be, Fast. I ought to be able to get stuff to you quicker than Amazon yep. can, right? If I only knew where it was, had the, the, the logistics chain ready to, to, to be able to deliver and was able to do it at the right cost. And, and distributed order management is enabling you to, to play with those variables, okay. knowing you know, what's where and how much it costs to move, and therefore enabling you to make a much better promise to your consumer than your other option, which is to say, you can have it within a week because I don't really know where it's well, coming Well, they used to from. ring around. Do you remember? They used to ring around all the stores, right? right? And you'd, you'd stand there for hours. Right. So I guess in some respects, Amazon has has helped you in terms of it's made your product probably a lot more desirable very quickly. Absolutely. I mean, we haven't quite spent three quarters no. of a billion <laughs> yet. Um, yet. Um, we accelerate in there very fast, but we haven't quite spent <laughs> that much. Um, but no, you know, it enables the the the, the retail um, okay. community to, to so take advantage of a big system. How big was it when you joined Fluent, when you started? How many, what sort of size were we talking? You said it was quite a small Australian-only business. Yeah, we were about, it was about 30 employees at the time. Okay, and um, where are you now? What are we, six years later? So you thought five years five later. later. So where, where are you now in terms of countries and size and yeah so if we go back five years it was about 30 folks um around 15 12 to 15 clients i think okay yep um and and revenue was um yeah i can say five five years ago revenue was 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 just a little north of a million in, okay. in license fees right per year if we fast forward five years um and and sorry and only only in australia right we fast right. forward yep. five years um, we have just around 100 full-time folks. We have around okay. 30 folks um, contracted to us offshore. Yep. Um, we have offices in New York, in LA, in Paris, in London, um, just about to open Singapore yep. um, and uh, Sydney and Melbourne. Um, we have 60-odd clients globally. Um, and I, I won't disclose the revenue um, now, but it's <laughs> significantly <laughs> a very, more. A very different world to that. And and we, you know, we 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 did a cap raise um, two years ago, uh, yep. just coming up for two years actually. So between eighteen months, two years ago, um, so we were able to raise uh, forty eight million dollars. That's a lot of money. It's a big raise. Forty eight yeah. million is a ma it's a massive raise. Yeah. So, um, and, and now we're, you know, in, in mode of looking at, at, at companies to, to acquire and, and merge with us to, what a, what to a grow change. our footprint. So it's, it's, a, it's, great, it's a great story. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's not been linear. It's not been perfect <laughs> <laughs> um, along the way, not without challenges, but we're, we're really proud of, well, really the people, right? Because, you know, when it, when it comes to it, we, we, we are, you know, technology is being built and yep. companies are buying technology but people are building that and and uh um and it's 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 really all, all about those people and so i'm really i'm really proud of the the people in the organization and you know we a lot of those people have grown have, yeah, have yeah. grown through and taken you know more senior roles we have brought more people in obviously of course but um but um we've, we've got some good internal growth and career progression which i which i love it's one of the things you know i I actually love seeing a, a, a promotion more than I do winning a deal these days. Yeah, well, that's good. It's a, just a bit more human and meaningful to, to well, me when I you mean, see that, someone you've worked with for a while, you know. There's a lot of deals. As, I mean, like, and it's interesting you said, you know, it hasn't been, hasn't been linear, as, as it never is. And, and one of the things I always like to discuss, and you would know this because I would have told you beforehand, but, you know, I, I love hearing about the success, but I also love hearing about maybe some of the challenges that go because that sort of growth in that time, you know, rapid growth, as you and I both know, is, is difficult in itself in terms of people and, and just the, the technology and also the, the capital raising. What was perhaps in that, you know, epic success, what was the biggest challenge that you think you've probably, um, or, or one of the, the, the hardest things that you've done that's probably made the biggest impact? Yeah, so um, c coming into the company, I had a, a very good international network. Yep. I was able to find, you know, big, company partners that wanted to work with us and, and implement our software and work with us, you know, big companies like Accenture and, yep. um, and, and Deloitte and others that, that were willing to come in the early days. Um, so that side of things hasn't been so much of a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, 
So I think that, I think the most challenging thing is is finding people who part with money to invest in you. Um, <laughs> I think that's always a, that's always a, look. It's it's a very common theme on this show. Um, I'm, yeah. yeah, tell us more. I'm intrigued. Yeah, and and also um, you know doing that in the right way. So I I, I love. Uh, loved the the story that we had up until you know sort of three years ago, which was you know Australian backed, Australian founded, Australian tech, and we're, it was we were able to tell a true blue story yep. there, right? Um, which I which I loved, and we can still talk about that as the company's as, as its foundations Absolutely. and its That's roots. Got the blue background, today, yeah, yeah, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and also its its cultural heritage, right? So we we. We, I might talk about that a bit more in a bit, but we 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 come back to you know we are an Australian grown company. Yep. Um, but in order to um, compete on an international stage, we need to feel European and we need to feel American um, to a, to an American uh, retailer and to yeah. a European uh, retailer, right? We need to we need to feel that way to them, um, and and part of that means you need. Uh, overseas advisory, overseas board members, overseas mm-hmm. money. Yeah. Um, actually, um, in order to to broaden that horizon and, and just get you some of those some of those uh, intros. We have a we have a, a really good VC uh, and private equity community here in Australia, and it's been growing fast. It has. Um, and so, with absolutely no disrespect to that, it, it was important for us to find overseas money as well. Yep. To supplement um, supplement that. And so, that was hard. Um, it's it's it, it, it's it's a challenge to do that first one, right? Yeah. To, to, to get through that Series A, but particularly the Series B raise, um, which is when you're after serious money. Yeah. Um, and at that point, you've got decent revenue, um, and and you've got growth path, and you've got margin, and and, and so on that you, you're able to show. Um, but um, you know, persuading a, a, a US or a European VC to back an Australian. Based company isn't the you know isn't the easiest thing. It's not a well trodden path. No, it's not. And and I've I've dealt with a lot of people who want to do that. So I'm intrigued. Are there any uh, is there anything that you learned along the way that might help people watching to give them some tips as to how you've obviously succeeded in doing that. Um, and before we talk about what the implications of actually that were, is there, have you got any tips as to how you how you went about that? And any any anything that you've learnt along the way? Well, you have to kiss a lot of frogs. Um, <laughs> I wonder why you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, and my, my, myself and, um, and and our founder spent you know spent a long time travelling and talking with potential investors over the course of 18 months, really. Pre-COVID, I guess, as well, which yeah, wouldn't, yeah, wouldn't absolutely. be as easy now. Yeah, it was much easier, <laughs> much easier then, um, much more difficult to do now. Um, so we talked to a lot of folks. Um, we, you know, we had our, uh, I mean, I use the phrase, we had our shit together. Yep. So we had, we had good materials, we had our story right, we had the metrics and everything prepared. We knew what we were doing there. Yeah. Um, but, but still... Um, it's um, you know it's you have to be better than the next best at you know let's let's we, we took money from from a US VC right yeah so you have to be better than the next US option which is right? not easy I wouldn't imagine right and you have to be you know if it's there's a, an additional risk premium if you like that comes to, for for an American VC to invest in an Australian company there's a risk premium yeah which means your numbers have to be a bit better. Right. Than than their other options, right? Because you know, there's 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 a fair amount of money out there to invest, but there are a lot of options to put your money. It's like into being the as coach's well, right? son, right? You've actually got to be better than the best player, yeah. much better, because you're the son, and he doesn't want to show the favourites. Almost almost a similar analogy, right? Yeah, ab- ab- absolutely. I can relate to that one. Um, <laughs> so you, um, so, so so that was that was difficult, and you know, a couple of false starts yep. um, along the way. Um, and and frankly, got quite hairy late on, um, as as we, you know, thought we'd closed a um, a, a deal out, um, and um, and and that VC just asked us for another couple of quarters of performance before the money would actually come in, and we didn't have a couple of quarters <laughs> of runway, um, right. and so we we had to go do something else fairly. Last minute's the wrong word, but we had to, you know, to, to change and, and, and go somewhere else. That and that was, running out, though. yeah, they did, and they, that's that's unfortunately their mo, which I didn't know. Yeah. Um, that put us, you know, when I'm going back, um, nearly. Are we going two years? I think we're going back two and a half years, right? Yeah, that okay. 
but before that Series B closed, that that put us from a, just from a cash flow point of view, not from the the shape of the business, but from a cash flow point of view, that put us in real strife. Yeah. For for a, for a few months actually, um, and um, and yeah, we got over that hump. But that was the that was the big challenging time, you know, okay. for us. And what was the um, what would you say is the greatest benefit that's come out of out of that? Uh, I think it's that I can focus on the company and the business okay, rather yeah. than focus on fundraising. Yeah, well, yeah, okay. Right. So when when your when your senior leadership team is is able to focus on growth and their jobs, that's better for everyone, including shareholders. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, rather than having to focus on on fundraising, because yeah, okay. fundraising takes a lot of time and a lot of energy, um, and um, and it's it's just. Ongoing, um, still is now. I mean, I, I'm still talking to, you know, potential investors a couple of times a week. You, yeah, okay. you, you keep, you know, you, you you speak to folks. You you, you know, you're not you're not 100 percent sure what when the next timing looks like for the next raise and who might be the ideal partner and and how much your existing partner wants to participate and so on. So you yeah. you can't ever close yourself off to to other conversations. But no, I'm I'm generally you know focused on the on the company, on the growth of the company, and the things that I should be thinking about as the as the CEO, CEO. which is fairly simple. It's maximising revenue and reducing cost. It's yep. not that <laughs> not <laughs> that complex. Kind of um, um, but I, I think from our our people point of view, it, it's also enabled me you know since at, at least a year ago to to be able to concentrate on our on our folks as well. Your, your leadership team and... and leadership team, and, yeah. all, all, you know, all of our people. Just, yeah. make, just making sure that as we're growing financially, so we're having great success in the market, you know, do our people feel like they're having great success permanently? Have they got career progression? Yeah. You know, and, and those kind of things, when you're running at 100 miles an hour, not as, you know, as a, as a, as a growth phase company, I won't call it startup because I think startup scale was, up, was scale a long time ago, but scale up would be the right term. Um, so when you're, when you're running in scale up, there are many processes that are iffy, and and, yep. and you, you you don't have those um, you don't have some of those processes in place that bigger companies have, and you particularly see that in 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 management, right? So if you work, I, I talked about SAP earlier. If you work in a large company like SAP as a manager, right, um, a lot of the processes are there for you. Yes. You know how do you run? Um, uh, performance reviews. How do you, you know? There's a manual, right? These things are all there. Yeah. there. There's bits of tech for you to use. When you're in a growth company, when you're in a scale up, none of that's there, right? Yeah. And you're doing all that yourself as well as managing your people, and and you end up not doing either of those two things particularly <laughs> yeah. well. And 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 that's that's I the same. I can relate with, to that too. <laughs> right. Yeah. And you're hiring people who can do rather than people who you you, you can do. afford to spend time to, yeah. to grow with and, and so shifting that dynamic so that you've got you know you've got people coming through you've got management who are managing and developing people and you know and then bringing people through with career progression is really important to me as a reason for running a company yeah okay um and um, being able to spend time doing that and, and overseeing a bit more of that than i was for the previous couple of years is 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 also something that i you know, I enjoy more, and I'm I'm quite passionate about from okay, you know cool. how does that company look? Because ultimately, as a CEO, that company is a reflection of me, whether I like it or I don't. Afraid so. Yes. Well, let's talk about you a bit more. Um, and this is this is it's one of my favourite questions, but it's, I also have a lot of people who watch watch the show tell me it's one of their favourite questions because you never know what someone's going to say. Um, and this is the belief question that we that we talked a little bit about earlier. So, you know, the question sort of is, you know, is there anything that's happened in your life that has Changed a fundamental belief that you had to something else, and I think you—I don't think you may, you may turn that on its head. I think we spoke about, but yeah, it, it's a really interesting because it doesn't have to reflect around fluent commerce. It could reflect about anything in, in any time in your life. But I think a belief is something that really is core to someone. So when it, it changes or reinforces or something, something's usually happened. So it's always interesting to hear this with everyone that comes on. Yeah, um, and I was thinking about this 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 question before from a from a fundamental belief. I'm 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 struggling a little bit on a on a complete change of belief, but there's certainly things that you know maybe I thought, but wasn't a hundred percent sure on, and have been able to you know confirm yep. and become a belief. That works. So 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 that that's a, a slight. Then we'll take that. I'll take that. Slight <laughs> run around the question, and 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 this one really comes to. Um, it, it really comes to how you think about your people, right? I, um, 
I have been really uh, fortunate is going to is going to be the right word. I've been fortunate to be involved in companies, you know, over the last 20 years who have had one a great deal of success, yeah, and two have had leadership that very much believed in empowerment and trust, okay, rather than command and control. Yep. Right. And what that's meant for me learning my trade before I become a CEO going through you know management and into senior management and so on I've I've been able to see kind of up until probably SAP um, been able to see um, empower and trust at, at work and and just what that can do how how, okay, how people cool. react and and perform when they're trusted and empowered versus when they're controlled and commanded right yeah um, now seeing that across organizations when it's not me really, as the ultimate empowerer and truster, um, gave me a, a, a pretty strong opinion and view that, you know, for me coming into a CEO role, that, um, you know, I needed to make sure that I was, you know, behaving and encouraging behavior of empowerment and trust rather than command and control. And, and I'm also a little bit of a control freak. <laughs> so <laughs> it's not the natural thing, right? So, yeah. you know, it's it's not natural and it's always uncomfortable. It doesn't matter, you know. It doesn't matter who you are. It's always unco- a little, somewhat uncomfortable, even privately. Unnerving, I think, is the word. Is yeah, that right? and you and you you have to leave something alone. Yes, and um and and and, and everything alone, and offer advice and and and. When you come, you have to realise this if you've got aspiring CEOs there. When you come in as a CEO, you've got a, you've got this title, and you come in and tell someone what you think. They take that as an instruction yep. for yep. a while until you can develop that relationship. We say, I'm, I'm just giving you, you asked me for an opinion, so I, I gave you one. It's your call. <laughs> yeah. But you have to reinforce that. It like, freaks people out a call. bit, doesn't it? Yeah. It does freak them out a bit. Well, they feel like they're, if, they, if they get it wrong, they're, they, they've just gone against what you, what you said. So you've got to create an environment where getting stuff wrong okay. is okay. Yeah. Right? That's your training budget. Right? I don't spend... <laughs> Hundreds of thousands of dollars on training budget, but getting stuff wrong forms part of that training yep. budget, right? As long as we learn that quickly and, and, and move on. And it's got to be okay. Um, but the so so coming back to, to the, the style, the, the you know, the, the style of management and leadership, um, just because I think that empowerment and trust is is the, is the right way it doesn't mean that the organization does and you've got to be re- really on on top of that to make sure there aren't pockets of command and control of command and control going on right which is because more typical than the empowerment really i've seen <laughs> it's absolutely more typical but but and and i and the problem the problem is i don't think until you see firsthand empowerment and trust really working yeah. and be surprised you don't believe it yeah, it's yeah. really hard to, right? So I understand people finding it difficult to, to, to let go. Yeah. And also, you know, those same people usually find it difficult to articulate their, um, their opinions in, in, in such a way that doesn't get taken as command and control either, right? But if you can nail that, that that's the, the reinforcement of belief is I continue to see what people do when you let them. Yeah, that's versus a good, I what like people that. do when you tell them. I love that. I've not heard put that way. When you let them, that's a really good. That's that's good. I like that. And and you know, I don't always get that right, um, but I you know I I try to. It's part of your own training budget. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And I don't articulate myself always. That sounds like I'm giving you scope. Sometimes I'll I'll sound like I'm giving an instruction, but um, you know, ultimately. Um, Ultimately, you, you, you are continually amazed by what people do when you give them scope to. Um, and you're never surprised by what people do when you tell them because they just do what they're told. Yeah. And usually not in the best way that it could be because you certainly don't know everything. So it's a belief that you're still trying to perfect. And I, would, I, I, understand, I understand that. And I think when you rushed, you tend to command and control without thinking about it because you're just rushed, right? Even though you don't really mean it that way. Um, and you're right, if you say things in a certain way, regardless of your previous behaviour, people sometimes go, oh, well, I better do it that way. It sounded like he really wanted me to do it that way this time. Um, mm. it's, yeah, it's, 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 an, that's a, it's an interesting topic, that one. Yeah, but it's, it's game-changing. Like for me, like I say, I've been lucky. And I, can, I continue to see folks who haven't been so lucky and struggle with that 
Yeah. In power. But I, t I tell you now, you know, for a, good, a good example, and I, I found it really hard to, to, to step back from this. Yeah. But, but probably the, the most important deal of the company's history so far um, was done this year um, and, and done by a very capable and senior member of, of my senior leadership team. Yep. Um, but letting them do that without me, you know, jumping in and, and interfering, getting involved was really hard. Did you go away? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, and I trust this person implicitly, right? Um, I, I'm just saying, like, it, it still, I, I found that hard. I succeeded, actually. I think... Well they, done. They, I can relate to that. I think they tell you well. that I left them to do, to do it, um, and they did a fabulous job. They, and uh, Again, a better job than I think I would have done. Right? Awesome. Well, that's even better. Um, which is, again, job of a CEO, find people that are better at stuff than you and surround yourself with yeah. them, right? Absolutely. Um, cool. So it, it, it works every time. Well, that's a good answer. It's different, but it's good. I like that. Okay, cool. Okay. Last question on you. Um, podcasts, what do you listen to? Other than obviously this one that you're sitting on right now. Um, it's, it's a question that I ask everybody because all books, you know, some people don't listen to podcasts, but most people with your um, time constraints can listen to podcasts in the car or maybe walking, but find reading quite difficult to fit in. So either or, or, or any that have had an impact on you or that you think that people might want to want to watch or listen so to. So I'm going to I'm going to give you the wrong answer to oh, this question. Oh, awesome! We love the wrong with the long answers um, because <laughs> um, so I, I found the last twelve months quite hard. I do, I used to read. Um, um, yeah, use Bling List to to to, to read yeah, okay. um, snippets of books. I've tried it. I didn't like it. And all those things that I'm supposed to do as a <laughs> as a CEO. Um, and so I, I do I do spend some time doing some of that research and reading snippets and trying to trying to find shorter ways to read a book. Right. Yeah. But I, I do still download those those books to one of my devices yep. or the. Blink list usually, um, okay. or we some pricey of those, um, and so I do read those. So from a podcast point of view, it's downtime for me. So I'm just trying to find things that make me laugh, make me laugh out loud. That's okay. It doesn't and, have to be business related. And um, and and just just you know give me something to relax. So when I'm in the in the in the car, um, and if the kids are in the car, then I usually have to stick my headphones on for these particular <laughs> the particular ones I'm listening to because they're not child friendly. But and, and they change all the time. So I, I now I, I really I, want to know what they you are. You know, I find, <laughs> <laughs> I find I'd have to check in my phone their names, but I, I find some. Um, I find some, you know, some ones that have been been rated, you know, at that time, hilarious by somebody, and I <laughs> listen to those. And if I don't like them for a few minutes, I, I get rid of them and flick to the next one. Fair enough. All right. So All right. Well, yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm not a big. Um, I'm not a big single or couple of podcasts. Okay. You know, subscriber. I, I jump around, but I, I tend to find, you know, some. Uh, infantile humour uh, ones for me to <laughs> we, listen. We're going to talk about this straight <laughs> yeah. after the camera's off. Okay. Exactly. All right, very last question then. So um, if someone is interested to learn more about Fluent, particularly if they're interested in working with Fluent, and you are on this continuous growth journey, and obviously we're on this with you, um, tell me, why would someone, from your, from your point of view, why would someone want to come and work for Fluent? Okay. Um, so th the question I can refine depending on what kind of roles, whether it's really technical or, or, or not yeah, non-technical roles, right? Um, if, I, if I think from a technical role, if we look in, in, in the market right now in, in, in Australia, um, there's a lot of good companies around, right? There's a lot. Um, so there's a lot of good places you can go and work. So I can, I can talk about how great a culture we might have, but everybody says the same thing. They do. Right? <laughs> So everyone's got great culture, so you should work for Not all of everyone, them. Not everyone, right? No, as in... Everyone on this show. As in if you read the, <laughs> you know, read the blurbs, right? Um, so, so from a technical role point of view, um, if, I, if I then talk about, you know, certainly leading edge tech, um, there are very few companies in Australia who are... You know, that, that real high growth stage. So we're mm. talking triple digit growth. Yep. There, there are very few of those. Um, there are very few who are global yep. um, and who are solving global problems, not, not just Australia wide problems. Yep. Um, a, and who are using, um, using that, that very modern technology. So we're, we're, we're involved in, in B2B SaaS 
world. Yep. Um, and, and we're using the latest and greatest tech. We're building frameworks. And, and that's not something that you can find very often. No, not but, at all. But talking about those high growth global based here in Australia companies, it, there's a handful of those. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, and so if you're not if you're not one of those who, who wants to go work at you know Google or, or, or Amazon um, in the in the local outpost and, and you're wanting to go and and build out a career in in um, in you know modern B2B tech as there are very few companies in Australia that give you that global in head office. Um, yeah yeah head office here which means you know Impact. core development here like so our core development uh, platform development is is here onshore yeah we do some application development offshore but our core platform development is, and, and as, as far as I can see into the future, will be here, right? Same, same with product management, all here on shore, yep. proudly Australian, right? Um, there are very few companies like that, um, that that you can go choose. So there are lots of good jobs and lots of great culture. Um, and we would, we would hope and believe that, that you know, that's, that's us too. Um, but I think from a career point of view, um, there, there are very few that will give you that same global growth view in, in B2B SaaS than, than you'll get with Fluent. Awesome, that's pretty darn And, and it's, it's very true, you know, we deal with an extraordinary amount of B2B SaaS companies, but there's not many that are doing what you're doing at your scale. And I think you've probably hit the nail on the head with the global problem, you know, that's probably a real rarity. There's very few, even the ones that have maybe launched overseas aren't necessarily quite solving a global problem yet. So, no, great and answer. That, and, and that's giving us a good, a good competitive advantage as well. Um, there's lots of American companies who are very American. There's lots of European Still companies are. who are very European. Um, we, we've managed to, to be and be considered by the analysts, which are you know important, global. <laughs> like we have global appeal. We, we are relevant, our technology is relevant for the Americas, for Europe, for APAC. And um, your customer base is across all of that as well, right? So it's, it's not right, just, yeah. you, it's proven. It's proven in the... In Absolutely, the, in yeah, the, exactly. The, so that's that's quite rare. Yeah. So there is an opportunity to grow in a, in a truly global um, company um, based here in in, uh, in Australia. And so I, I, would, I would hope that that's, um, that's appealing enough. We pay at least um, market and above rates. You pay well. Rates. You, pay so well. It's, you definitely it, pay you well. Know, we're, not, we're not scrimping on that. There was a time when we would try and... You know, save as much as we could everywhere, including including salaries. But that time's long gone. Yep. Um, so yeah, we're we're a we're a, we're a healthy, growing, vibrant, um, and interesting company. You know, we we are building frameworks that that um, you don't you don't often get a chance to build. No, I've heard that um, from tech some of the tech guys right? we've spoken you don't, with. Don't yeah. often get a chance to do that. So um, yeah, we we're, we're we're pretty proud of that. Very cool. Graham, thank you so much. It's been a pleasure, pleasure. to get you on here. I'm glad we did it. Um, and I will let you, you get back to the crazy life and your inappropriate <laughs> podcast on the drive out of here. Yes, I'll go pretend <laughs> to be very busy again. All right. All right. Thanks, All Graham. Right, thanks, Steve. Good job. Cheers.